Hey, welcome to Talking Maine with a Bowtie Boy. I'm Tom Saviello. Glad you're tuning in. I got my good friend Randy Hall here. Randy, thanks for coming. Good to see you, Tom. I'm glad the cows let you come out. They did. And that other brother of yours, he yeah, let you well, go he's, to? Yeah, he's home working today. Oh, well, it's about time he's working. <laughs> Probably you do all the work on that farm. Well, anyway. we, we split it up pretty good, uh, so there's good always enough there. to do. So nice farm, nice maple syrup, yeah. you know, great group. So... You're a legislator, huh? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you that's, followed these famous footsteps. This Russell Black guy. That's right. The Tom Saviello. Tom Saviello. Guy, that's, yeah, exactly. Uh, I hear that you're doing pretty good things. Well, I'd like to hope so. I mean, I got my feet wet down there, but I'll oh. tell you, it's a it's a different type of uh, yeah, world yeah. down there. You know, different than than the farming life. That's for sure. So, so what did you? What was your? What like when you walked in there? What did? What was it like? I was. I was. Almost overwhelmed, to be honest with you. Uh, you walk into the into the chamber, and you know, and and it, it's, it's huge. Yeah. There's 151 members in there, and and you go in, and uh, I knew a few of the guys before I I got there, so you know, I had a little idea what I was getting into, but. Uh, it's, it's fun. It's fun. It's interesting. I, I know when I walked in there for the first time, I had been there before, but I hadn't been in since they redid it because during the King administration, they, they really cleaned it up. I okay. had been in there prior to that, you know, like the little tunnel underneath. Right. Yep. That used to be a pigsty. It was horrible. It was dirty. <laughs> and, and I walked in and there were these beautiful uh, panoramas or whatever they call right. them. Yep. And then I walk upstairs to the floor of the house, and it was like, oh, my God, what am I doing here? Yeah, that's kind of the way I felt, <laughs> yeah, to be like, honest with you. Like, oh, my God, what am I doing here? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, so what, what were some things that happened that you were really surprised at when you got there? Well, you know, it's the camaraderie amongst people. I mean, you have your Republicans, you have your Democrats, but we get along. You know, you hear about... You're on this side of the aisle, you're on this side of the aisle. And, and granted, this time the speaker, you know, kind of mixed it up. We all sat together, which was good. I mean, we, got, we all became friends. Yeah. There was no doubt about it. Yeah. We're all friends. Um, you know, and you hear about, well, well you're not going to cross party lines. You're not going to vote. You do. You, you vote for the, for the goodness of your district. And, you know, and that's what I've, I've tried to do when I was down there. Is, and some of the votes I've had to stop and think about... And I had a good friend of mine ask me before, before I went, he says, if you get elected, he says, how are you going to vote? And I said, well, you know, I said, I'm going to have to stop and think about what the, the good of the district is. It may not be for the good of myself, but the people who sent me there, that's who I'm representing. So, you know, that's kind of the kind of way I've approached it. Yeah, and, and, you know, that's why you've been my friend and supported because that's what I did. I mean, yeah. basically, you go down there, they, they, uh, they hired you. And yes, election day. exactly. And they expect yep. you to represent yep. them. Right. Uh, and, and I often tell people that you think this bickering goes on. No. No, there's no bickering. No, not at all. Because, but you read the, the few, f of all the 2,000 bills that get introduced, yeah. Yeah. they get down, down to 50 that are controversial. Yeah. And now that maybe there'll be 15 that you debate and yeah. take a side on. And some of those end up being partisan votes. Exactly. But, but that's out of 2,000 bills. That's right. But that's, that's right. the headlines in the newspaper. That's the headlines, yeah. yeah. And you voted, a, you voted either for or against yeah. this. And, you know, that's the way it is. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and we had, uh, well, last year, like you said, we had 2,000 2, bills. And, and uh, I think we narrowed it down. There was like 400 got left on the table because of this COVID thing. So, um, and we talked about, you know, we, we kind of figured back in March, we was in there in March and they said, you know, the COVID's coming along, we're going to, we may get, next week we may recess for, for a couple of weeks. And I'm like, yeah, okay, maybe. So we go in on a Monday morning, and they said, tomorrow, plan on a long day because we're adjourning tomorrow night. I was like, there's no way possible. We voted on the budget. I mean, talk about ramming things through. I mean, we voted on a budget, and we adjourned and said, we'll probably be back in a couple of weeks. And now it's seven months later, and it never okay. went back. There was a little talk back in the summer about us going back for uh, um, some of the bills. And our caucus, the Republican caucus, said that, you know, we'd go back if it was COVID-related or emergency legislation do dealing with the pandemic. And we didn't get a lot of support for that. We was, we was kind of pushed aside and said, no, if we go back, we're going to do the whole slate, all 400 bills. And we said, no, there's a lot of bills there that don't that don't need to be worked. You know, they're, they're just personal 
preference things that, and we didn't feel that they was, you know, worthy of us spending to the taxpayers' money to go, to go back to, to hash over and probably be voted out anyway. So yeah. that's kind of why we haven't, haven't and, gone back. And with the health risk that was out there. Well, exactly. You know, why yeah. go back for these, because you could have been there weeks with the 400 right. bills, where right. it was rather yeah. than a short period of time. Right. And, uh, you know, one of the things I laughed about is I said, well, you would have been breaking the guidelines that the governor mm -hmm. issued because you would have had more than 50 in the same room. Uh, that's gathering, it. You know, that's and, it. You know, you know. It's, it's like, you know, you can't do that unless she lifts that restriction. Yeah. And you still can't have more than 100 people. More than 100. So, so the 50 people from Portland have to stay out. And the rest <laughs> of you guys make a good decision. <laughs> yeah, there you Maybe go. It'll work out yeah, pretty good. I don't, I don't think that's going to fly. But. I don't think so. <laughs> but, you know, and I've had this question, and I've asked some of the other legislators, what are we going to do after the election? Because we're going to need to go back. Um, or you know whoever's elected is going to need to go in, and we're going to need to get signed up for a, for Sworn everything get and get in. How are we going to have committee meetings? How are we going to have people come, you know, from the from the public to come in and testify? Um, the the only thing, the only solution that I've heard is that the uh, legislature, the house, the house may go up to the civic center and be spread out, and the senate may go into the house chamber so they can be spread out which would work, but still, how do you involve the public? That is a great and question. I don't know. I, I don't have the answer to that. Yeah, that's a great question because at the end, the very last couple of days, they pretty much told the public you can't come in. Exactly. The lobbyists, yeah. you can't come in, which has been okay with me, but you can't come in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so it leads you guys to operate, and we'll, yeah. which is not fair to the public. It isn't. All. It isn't. You know, whether you like what they have to say or not, well, it's definitely fair. You know, everybody has an opinion, and, and uh, you need to listen to them because there's some... There's always some pros and cons, and there's good points to every each side. Yeah, so, so. It, it, you're, you're absolutely right because that would be concerning to me. I mean, yeah. do you, even if you go to the Civic Center and you're meeting there, how do I go to talk to you? You're my legislator. Right. How do I go, Randy, I'd right. like to talk with you. Well, I, sorry, I can't, Tom, because yeah. I've got to be six feet away or I can't take the risk. And then let's just say I come down and, and I have the disease. I don't have, I'm asymptomatic. Don't know yeah. it until I get tested, and I pass it on to you. And now you go and infect your colleagues. That exactly. It's going to be a really interesting time to it, to, to it see is. how that they deal with it this is. thing. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I know we've done a lot of things uh, virtual, you know, on the computer. And uh, uh, I'll give you a case in point. I mean, it, it's a couple of weeks ago the uh, Chamber of Commerce had a had a uh, virtual um, forum. They call yeah, it local. Yeah. And and I got on. I got on, and then for some reason, I got bumped. We was having internet issues. I got bumped, oh. and I spent forty-five minutes trying to get back on, and I just couldn't. And by the time I got did get back onto it, the thing was basically over. So I mean, I missed the whole thing. So you know, oh, what, what are you going to do? You know, <laughs> and I have um, uh, Sue Pratt, who is the um, Republican um, leader for the county. She kept sending me text messages, and said, "Try this, try this." I'm like. I'm trying it. I've done that, and I just can't get through. But, you know, that brings up a good point. We had talked about a year ago, and it's been hashed over for quite a while, about Internet service and high-speed yeah. Internet statewide. And this pandemic has really brought it out. We need to upgrade our, our Internet service because there's so many people. And, you know, take, like, um, the people up in New Vineyard. I've had a couple of colleagues call me from there and say, you know, my, my kid or my grandchildren is trying to do schoolwork, and we have no Internet service up here. And we need to do something. If And this is a perfect example right. why. It's, it's interesting, Randy. <coughs> Back when I first got in the legislature, and Internet was still in the, uh, the hardwired ways. It wasn't yes. really becoming yeah. uh, the Internet in the sense that it was right. uh, uh, out in cyberspace. And, but at the time, John Baldacci wanted wind power. Mm -hmm. And every time I drive to Augusta and my phone would drop, yeah. I'd get mad and i say, if, we on if only I was smart enough, I didn't know. I mean, this is brand new. I'd come out sure. of the environmental sure. manager to say, it's not wind power, guys. We need to get internet service and high-speed internet service and cell phone coverage here. Yeah. We get those two things. We would have set ourselves up for, the, for that pandemic and econo oh, absolutely. economically. Absolutely. Because yeah. yeah, people are moving in here and they're buying houses and paying big prices for it, which is going to kill yeah. our property tax. But anyway, yeah. they're paying big <laughs> prices for it. And, but they want a place that they have high-speed Internet. Right. So right. Wilton, Farmington, they're paying the price. Yeah. Madrid, yeah. No, not so much. Right. But you take, like, for instance, you speak about that. I mean, living in East Dixfield, which is, it's in a valley, and our 
cell phone service. Hey, if you call me on my cell phone, I got to sometimes I have to go to a window and sit <laughs> sit in the window and so I can talk so you know I don't it doesn't drop the call you know yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah and there's places you can get service and places you can't yeah, so yeah. you know <laughs> I mean I, I used to know where they all were and I would have addressed them I said I could, so I'd be talking to somebody right. listen I'm gonna I, I'm, I'm gonna lose you coming up through Fayette as you just get up with mm. the big with the turn and there's a hedge there I said I'm gonna lose you in about two minutes and sure right. enough two minutes it's gone yeah. you know I know yeah. where it comes and goes so. yeah yeah did now did you have any bills in this year. I co-sponsored a few bills. I didn't put anything in you directly, and you know I'd had some people talk with me, and I didn't have anything that anyone brought up. So, no, I didn't put anything. That's okay. I yeah. had three yeah. in my first term. Oh, really? Okay. And then okay. Charlie uh, yeah. Lavertier, who I had replaced at yes. the time, yep. I said, Charlie, what should I do? And he looked at me and he says, You don't talk more than three times on the floor the whole time you're there. That right. first first year, right. three times, no more than three times. Yep. And I looked at him and said, Because he said you're a rookie, you don't know what's going on. Okay, so I literally took his advice. Right. Two times I spoke is when the committee chair asked me if I would refer the bill. Okay. So that I did that. Okay. And then one time I think I entered into one of the debates. Yeah. That was it. Yep. I didn't talk three times. I listened. Yeah. I always get uh, fl flabbergasted when I was there when guys that have never been there before get up and they're literally their first day there. They give an hour speech. <laughs> it's so funny you should mention that because I'm under that same philosophy. I went down there and I said. I'm going to learn what this is all about. And good friend of mine, Lance Havel. Yeah. Lance grew up across the street from yeah. me, and Lance worked on the farm for us in high school. and So Lance and I have been very good friends the whole life. And uh, Lance said to me, he says, you know, you get down there, he says, you've got to learn the ropes. And Lance likes to talk. Yeah. But, but, you know, he said, you know, you should sit back. And I did. I only spoke twice. And once was on... Uh, on Ag Day, when we um, sponsored the the maple syrup there, and then and then I spoke on a, one of the bills about uh, about poultry. And anyways, uh, but the rest of the time I sat now, and I had the guy sitting next to me. He says, uh, "You don't say much," and I said, "I'm just listening." I said, "My vote's just as good as yours," so I said, "I don't need to get up." And I said, "And, and furthermore, why would I get up and say exactly what the same guy ahead of me just said, only in my words?" And he's like, "Yeah, I guess you got a point." So. But but then there was a, there was another uh, legislator from down on the coast, and he was on the on the ag committee with me, and he sat right beside me, and we became good friends. And he's quite outspoken on things, and it's his first year. He had an opinion on everything, everything and it got to the point. It's like, oh my word, is he going to get up and talk again? <laughs> you know, again. <laughs> yeah. When, when, I, when I was there, <clears throat> a gentleman named Bob Daigle, who uh, was from Arundel, mm -hmm. Republican, and Bob had what he called the on and on society. Yep. That would they would get up and go on and on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so at one point Bob stood up and he said, "Mr. Speaker, and ladies and gentlemen of the house, I stand up to find, say that I'm glad the on and on society continues to go on and on." Uh, and we we had one legislator, and I won't tell you who she is because she's a good friend, but she would she used to sit in the front row. Uh -huh. And when she would speak, no one could hear her really well, and okay. and she would whine on and on and on mm. about it was oblivious was oblivious to everything. Right. So all of the people, since she was in the front row but back, would leave. <laughs> so we're in the you know the different the computer room sure. and the different places. All sure. the bell bell rings, which would tell us to come in. They come in and vote, right? So we all come back. Oh, she's finally done. No, she's still speaking. And we find out they didn't have a quorum anymore in the house, and they need to call us oh, back no. in again. Oh, no, <laughs> get in. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And Eddie Kelleher, who. I don't know whether Eddie's still with us or not. Eddie was um, in the legislature when John Martin was the mm -hmm. uh, speaker. And Eddie was, when I got down there, was a legislative liaison for okay. the courts. Okay. And Eddie it was a really nice man. And I, Eddie was telling me, he said, one day, he said, this guy got up and spoke. And you remember, right, you're not allowed to criticize a person no, before. No, you can simply and you say, can't right, speak their name. You have to speak say, where, they're where they're from. Where they're from. And the good representative from Cumberland or whatever. Right. And, and so... You would get up there, and he, he stood up, and this guy gave this big, long speech, and then Eddie stood up and says, Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the House, I rise to say, to say nothing, nothing at all, just like the previous speaker from Cumberland. He sat down. <laughs> so before he got hammered down, he was already down in his seat. Right. Because you know, they were pretty fed up with the yeah, guy. But, yeah. yeah. And there's some protocols that are there. Yes, you know, there is. You know, yeah. when you, yeah. So what do you, when you stand up, what do you have to say? Uh, you have to say, well, of course, now it's the speaker yeah, is a lady. Right, right. Uh, Ms. Uh, Sarah Gideon. So yeah. we say, Madam Speaker, and uh, I rise, you know, and, yeah, then, and yeah. then they'll, 
and then they'll they'll call on you. Yeah. And yeah. she has a she has a computer screen up yeah. on her desk so that she can she knows who's pushed that button that yeah. wa and wants to speak. And and she'll like if you're debating something and she'll say, well, I have you know. 15 people in yeah, the, yeah. you know, in, in the roster and you're thinking, oh my word, we're going to listen to 15 more people, you know, and everyone's basically saying the same thing. Yeah, right. So you might get up and, you know, go out and get a drink of water and, you know, yeah. use the restroom or whatnot. But, uh, and, and one thing uh, Senator Black told me before I got down there, he says, when you get there, he says, you want to sit on the end of the aisle or up near the back so you, he says, easy to get out. I couldn't have got stuck in the center, <laughs> any closer, if I just sat next to me, which my good friend of mine from uh, Josh Morris from down in Turner, he sits right beside me. He's dead center. There's 13 people in the aisle. He's the <laughs> middle one, and I sit just to the left of him. There's five, five rows in front of us and five rows behind us. We are dead center. We're stuck there. So and it's, now, now you've got Scott Landry from yeah. right here in Farmington. Now I asked Scott, I says, so Scott, would you, did you pull some strings or did you just get in trouble before you went? Scott sits in the front row, in the center aisle, right in front of the speaker, the teacher. Uh, <laughs> I said, Scott, you must have really, you really upset somebody when, yeah. when they gave the seating assignment. <laughs> yeah, they, you get the, you got the front row seat. Wow. <laughs> he said, I know. He says, I can't see a thing what's going on behind me. <laughs> that would drive me crazy. When I first got there, I sat, they, they put me between two very uh, liberal ladies, wonderful ladies, Linda McKee and Joanne Toomey. And they actually put me there thinking we would never get along. Right. Because I was more conservative. Sure, sure. And we created quite a friendship. And Linda the McKee, I, I owe to her a lot of the stuff I used to do for constituency. As, as you know, I used to write letters and cards oh, and sure. all that stuff. Right. She's the one that told me to do that. And I right. really followed through. And, and Joanne and I, we just became really good friends. And we're uh -huh. still friends. Yeah. Uh, but they didn't expect us to get... But that was yeah. kind of halfway down. And it was like Linda, me, and Joanne. So I only had one person to go out. Yeah. So the next year, I literally got the back row. And it was Janet Mills... Ed, uh, uh, Ray Pino and myself in the okay. very back row on the Democratic side. Okay. They kept me there until I switched and got out of the Democratic Party. The next year I came back, I was in the middle. <laughs> in the middle. <laughs> I was in the middle. Yeah. I, mean, I had great yeah. seatmates. Mike yeah. Thibodeau was one of my oh, teammates. Oh, sure, yeah. Mike yeah. was one yeah. of my teammates. Um, oh, I just, his, his, uh, his brother is there now. And he's Steve, um, oh gosh, Jeff, Jeff is his brother. And I'm, I'm drawing it, but Steve was wonderful to sit next to. Okay. And then yeah. Ann Haskell, who ultimately yeah. ended up in the Senate with me, was just a yeah. wonderful yeah. lady. So I, I had really good friendships, yeah. like you say. And you, I, you, do. you do. You just develop, you know, yeah. I, we're all people. Yeah. You know, we're all, you know. Yeah. It's like a dis, I call it a dysfunctional family. Exactly. Because it's yeah. like you all, when anybody gets in trouble down there, personally or otherwise, Everybody rallies around them. They oh, do yeah. whatever they can do to help them out. <laughs> but when they're and but they're still bicker like crazy later because they don't agree. <laughs> I got to tell you a quick story about, about getting in trouble down there. So John Devoe out of Caribou. Yeah. And John's is uh, a veteran, and John he sat right directly behind me. And and John's he he'll, he'll tell you he's hot tempered. So we was debating something one day, and John got up two or three times to speak on the same subject. Well, it got time to vote, and John got up and walked out. And the speaker said, you, you cannot leave. John says, I'm not voting. And John's a big man. Um, he's probably 6'4", and not, he's very muscular because he's been in the, in the armed forces, you know. And, and he, he actually, he left. Did the bell start ringing? The bell was oh, ringing, and he left. And they tried to stop him at the door, and he went out. And we sat there for probably, I bet, 15, 20 minutes before John came back in. And he d he did vote before he got done. But, you know, I'm, I'm sitting, sitting there thinking, John, just don't, please, don't throw anything. Because I'm sitting right in front of him, you know. But, and, you know, nice, nice guy. You know, he just, but he, was, he just, he was felt very strongly about, about what what we say. was doing. Yeah. I mean, I, and so the people that know it don't know, understand at home is when the bell rings, when mm -hmm. they finally say, "Are there any more, there are no more speakers?" and right. they start ringing the bell. They actually put a rope up across the back. Yes. And you you have to vote you if have you're in the vote. chamber. If yes. you don't want to vote, you should leave the chamber before, before the bell, the bell, bell rings. rings. Yes. And once it goes up, you're not allowed. There's stories they tell about John Martin where he had a guy that was just being belligerent and sat in his in his seat and refused to vote. 
And John finally had, I forget, he had the security of someone to come and remove the gentleman because he wouldn't vote. They went on for hours with the bell ringing. Oh, my uh, God. <laughs> and, and then, then you, so I got to be Speaker Pro Tem one time. Okay. Right near the end of my yes, term. Yes, sure, and So sure. Hannah Pingree sends me a note. As you know, notes, yeah. your notepad gets stolen, oh. you're in trouble, right? Yes. So Hannah sends yes. me this note. It's from her, and it says, would you like to be the, uh, um, the uh Speaker pro tem. Sure. So first thing I did right back to her, is this really from you? <laughs> she writes back, yes. Yeah. So I go up there and they give me the, the hammer. And the first thing I do, and Millie McFarlane, who's passed away, was the uh, clerk at the time, said, I camera the thing. She says, my first job is I'm now going to assign Representative Thibodeau as the keeper of the rope. Because he said, he kept telling me, I always, he said, I always want to do that. Yeah. And then I said, and if you're going to stand up and say you have really nothing to say, nothing to add, and weren't going to speak, then don't get up. That's right. And by that time, they're in a panic about <laughs> yeah. what I'm doing. What you're going to do, oh right? My God. Yeah, how's he going to run this thing? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and so I ran one bill, and they, they said, well, thank you very much, yeah. uh, Representative. We will go they on didn't nail it. You do another, another one. <laughs> so, Randy, one of yeah. your other jobs up here is that you are president of the fair. Yes. So yeah. tell us a little bit about what happened this year and what your hopes oh, are. Oh, boy. I'll tell you, this has been a, been a challenge this year. Um, we was one of the last fairs to cancel. To cancel. And we, we had hoped, we'd hoped, you know, that this whole pandemic thing was going was gonna to pass. Because, I mean, back in March, everyone said, well, you know, by Memorial Day. And then it was Memorial Day, well, by the 4th of July. So we decided that early on we was going to wait until some of the fairs started canceling. We said, we'll wait till 1st of August and cancel, you know. But by mid-June, we was getting a lot of calls from our vendors saying, hey, look, we need to know ahead of time so that we know whether to order, you know, supplies and, and whatnot for the fair. So, you know, so we did. We, we canceled the 1st of July. And, um, you know, I, I felt bad because so many people rely on the fair. And, you know, I... I, I do myself, and, and uh, JP, uh, when I came in this morning, we was talking about the fair, and you know, we, we had withdrawals from it, you know, <laughs> yeah. the Demolition Derby, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. the night of the Demolition Derby, you know, I mean, that's, as I say, you know, the fair helps clean up the community because we think of all the old junk cars that get hauled yeah, yeah, to the yeah, fair yeah, yeah, for the Demolition yeah, yeah. Derby, and then they go to the Crusher, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And other than that, they're going to sit yeah, out somebody's behind yard, somebody, yeah. in somebody's yard, so, um, we did, we was able to uh, get a PPP loan. Back oh, in the good. in the beginning, and we we had our summer maintenance crew work throughout that until the you know the money was used up. So that you know there's always maintenance on the fairgrounds. I mean you got those old buildings, and you know you got roofs to repair and some siding that's come off over the winter time, and you know just little things. You know the snowplow hits the fence, and you know you got to repair that. And so we was able to fix things up. And patch things together, so fingers crossed, we're going to be able to go next year. And Tom White is a maintenance. Tom's our maintenance. He's done man. a phenomenal oh, yeah. job. Yeah. He really has yeah. since he took yeah. that position. Yeah. And really has. getting that place back in shape. Yeah. So my thanks goes to him yeah. for all that work. Yeah. So because the reason I was upset is I didn't win my blue ribbon for my apples. This year. <laughs> I mean, I have the. Of course, I don't tell anybody I'm the only one who puts any in. Well, yeah. I mean, the thing of it is, you know, I mean, in the past we've had uh, you know baking contests like uh, apple pies and yeah. stuff like that, and I was a little upset I didn't get to judge any of those yeah, things, yeah. You know? I got to do the blueberry one a couple years ago. <laughs> right. But, it, it, you know, it, it's a, such a tradition here. I mean, I, it is. It's, no matter what happens, it's fair week. You have to go to exactly. fair week. Exactly, exactly. And, and you know. you're right. There are so many little groups that benefit yeah. from it, whether it be yeah. the historical society, whether it be yeah. the church that has the pies. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the places that a lot of my apples went. Is sure. that I had two groups that came over to pick apples at the house that were going to use the apples to make apple. But this is last year, right, right. to sell them for the cancer society. So right. and yeah. so this year I didn't have yeah. them come over. So I got a couple box of apples. I got to give the Marge Cormier to make some go. more apple pies with. But there you go. Yeah. Uh, so you know, it, it really changes everything. The dynamic. It, it it does because you know people gear up for the summer. You know, yeah. go to Farmington Fair and. Uh, the fair, the fair associations also, and I'm, I'm past president of the Maine Agricultural Association of Fairs, which is it's like the state fair association. And everybody always tells me Farmington Fair has the best exhibition hall. And I say, well, you got to think about this. When do people harvest? They harvest Farmington Fair time. Right. So that's why we have always have tomatoes and cucumbers right, and pumpkins right, and squash right, and right. you know it's harvest season. Yeah. And uh, I hadn't thought know, of that. You know that that's the 
That's the big reason. I mean, yeah, because so. I know when I bring my apples over, they're just right. Are there, yeah. the Macs are ready? The Macallans are ready. The Reds are not quite there, not but, quite, but, but almost, but almost. So yeah. you can really see the fruit right. and vegetables right. of everybody's life, yeah. and, and the Grangers that set up oh. there. They're yeah. bringing in fresh stuff in there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. you're right. And then yeah. I, I bring my flowers over, sure. and they're just perfect at that time of yeah. the year. You yeah. know, because the next week I usually deadhead them for the winter time. So yeah, because we haven't quite gotten a frost, quite gotten a frost yeah. but you know, you know, and it, and that brings up another thing. You know, we talk about climate change. I remember as a kid going to the fair, and we always had a heavy frost, Farmington Fair Week. In the last few years, we haven't. Yeah. I mean, I think we had one this year, but you know. Typically, the last 10, 15 years, we haven't had a frost until, you know, around the 1st of October. I, I agree. So, I, you know, our growing season is a little longer and, yeah. and whatnot. I mean, I have a white peach tree that I bought, and I didn't know it was white until it, but it, I didn't pick peaches off it until the second week in October. Oh, no kidding. So that yeah. tells yeah. me, and they're so sweet. Right, right. And that tells me that something's changed dramatically because peach trees, what I understand, is not the length of day, it's the heat of the day. Okay. That gets them to ripen. Right. So I've gotten my peach crop off of it this year, which were sure. beautiful peaches. Sure. So it, yeah. climate change is real. I mean, we, yeah. can we do something about it? I'm not sure. But well, the thing is, uh, you know, I'd like to think that we could, but you know, you stop and think about the state of Maine. We're just a, a small, small, yeah. small segment in the whole yeah. worldwide, and it. It's got to be a worldwide thing. It's got to be everybody. I mean, it we does. can do what we do, and I, I often give quizzes to kids when I say we talk about, do you drive a car that gets more than 25 miles a gallon, or do your parents? Do you have other energy or alternatives in your house besides oil? Like, do you have wood stove, wood right. pellets? Sure. Um, do you have energy-efficient appliances? Mm -hmm. Have you got great insulation in your house? I can't remember what the fifth one is, but if you answer yes to all of that, you are part of the solution here. Sure. sure. You're taking personal right. responsibility. If you answer right. no then you need to think about this because that's the kind right. of, th that will make a huge difference. And the state does have programs that can encourage people oh, to do that, you know, whether absolutely. it's efficiency, Maine, and so forth. Yeah. So yeah. so how the cow business, how, how you guys survive, and how did they survive? Well, COVID? you know, the, the cows still need to be milked twice a day, and, you know, they, they still eat a lot, and they make a lot of out the other end, and, you know, <laughs> things haven't really changed in the, they, in they, the they, farming. They, uh, you know, back when it first uh, this whole pandemic first started, you know, there was there was some shortages of food on the on really? the shelves and stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, with the milk yeah, and yeah. whatnot. And and what the problem was, there was there was plenty of milk out there because the cows didn't stop giving yeah, right, milk right, right, because right, right. everything else closed down. But the way the problem was is in the processing factories. Oh. Because you take like the the kids stop going to school, so they were all geared up. The processes were geared up to do half pints yeah. and, and whatnot. And then you don't go to the store and buy a half pint, you buy a gallon. Well, they're, they're pumping out the gallons as fast as they can pump them out, but the machine can only just do so many gallons per day. So that's where the problem was lying. And then, the, like with the restaurants and whatnot, you know, they might, you know, use the five-gallon um, bags that go into the dispensers. They weren't using them anymore. Wow. You know, so, they, so these machines that are pumping out the gallons and the half gallons are going 24-7, and they just can't keep up. And the other machines are sitting idle. So that's where the problem was. Wow, I hadn't thought about that. And, right. you know, one of the things that we're, we're running into also is, uh, is like, well, people are buying local now. So the people like, you know, myself and Senator Black that have got a few beef cows, you know, we're, you know, we're selling meat and whatnot. We can't get it processed. Some of these processes right now are, are uh, signed up way out into 2022. Really? In order to get a, a date to get an animal, you know, processed and packaged. Really? Yeah, and uh, you know, so so the people buying these little piglets, and, and you know, now it's time for the pig to, to go to you know go to the butcher, and there's no place to take them. Oh my goodness! So you know, it's it's caused a really big problem right now, and I know there are, are a few processing places, small ones that are opening up, but but they're just they're overwhelmed. Wow. Uh, a good friend of mine, Don Castongway, down in in Livermore, right. and uh, I called him the other day, and he says. I had, an, I had an animal I wanted to get in, and Don says, I'd really love to help you out, but he says, I don't have any room in my cooler. He says, I'm working seven days a week right now, and he says, I just can't keep up. Wow. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's an issue right now, wow, the that's big a, issue. Yeah. How many cows are you guys milking? We milk about 50. And yours is all organic. We're right? organic. Uh, we go to it's Organic Valley. And uh, actually, our milk ends up at Stonyfield down in New oh, Hampshire no and to be or, organic the yogurt. yogurt. Yeah. Have been since 2002. 2002. Yeah, 18, 18 years. 18 now. years. Yeah. And so you, the market's been good for you it's guys. It's very good. Yeah. yeah. Compared yeah. to others that yeah. have had to close down. But yeah. That's great. Yeah. And that, you know, 
back in 2002, we was, we was shipping our milk, and it actually was going to uh, Hoods in Portland through Agrimark, which was a, low, a co-op, northeast co-op. And uh, my dad came to us, and he said, you know, we just, our family farm's not going to survive. We just can't do it. And that was when the big organic push was going on, and we jumped on the bandwagon. And that's the only reason we're still in business. Wow. And, you know? it, and it's hard to get organic feed, too, I would imagine. It it's is. It's expensive. We're, we're very lucky because we, we raise all of our own feed. We do purchase grain. It comes out of Vermont. But uh, uh, we, we raise all our own forage, and uh, we actually have... We sell for it. This year, we're a little tight. Yeah, we're not selling dry. a lot. We're yeah. a little tight. And, and I thought we was going to have plenty, but where we didn't have rain, we didn't get a third cut. So You, you didn't know. get the third cut. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was pretty sparse. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. interesting. I knew that watching it this year because it got so dry there yeah. in the sept end of August and September. Oh, it, was it was powder in the yeah. soil. And the problem was, too, is that you, it, when it gets like that, the pastures get like that, you start feeding. You have to feed your... Earlier, yeah. Get into your yeah. winter feed supply. So... You know, you, you usually don't start feeding until, you know, end of September, 1st of October. And then you, when you start a month early. Yeah, you are. Mm -hmm. Are you selling any milk out of the farm? If somebody we do not. You do no, not. So I just no. want to make sure that if anybody yeah. was watching, thought yeah. they could go there. No, the only thing we've got, we set up a, a little stand um, to sell our maple products. Yeah. Because where well, we missed out on maple syrup Sunday and uh, maple Sunday and stuff. But, that, that's about all we sell. Well, Randy, thank you. It was really yeah. interesting. Yeah. So later on, when hopefully you might go back, will you come back on the show and tell us what's Absolutely. going on? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And you can leave that Rodney guy home. Well, somebody's got to do the work. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah and I'm sure, though, when you're gone, that's the only time oh, yeah. he does anything, yeah, knowing yeah. Rodney the way. Oh, there'll be a list when I get home today. Uh, yeah, I'm you're sure. probably. Yeah, you were savvy. Oh, you've yeah, got to do all yeah. this stuff. Yeah, right. Randy, thank yeah. you so much. Good to see you, thanks, Tom. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time on Talking Maine. Perfect. That would be great. Good.